I'm amazed how many people own stocks. Welcome to the Playing Footsie Podcast. My name's Paul, and each episode, me and the lads get together to talk about the stocks, stock market news, and finance in general. Quick disclaimer, you shouldn't consider anything in this podcast as personal financial advice. If you need such advice, go to a financial advisor. And please remember, when investing in any form, your capital is at risk. So sit back, relax, and let the lads fill you in with all the stock market news of the week. All right, so let's have a look. What's going on? Um, anyone seen the Arc X ETF that got released today? I haven't had a good look down it, but it's um, there's a lot of weird stuff in there. Um, anyone got it up in front of them so they can just read out what Arc are putting into? This is the Arc Space ETF. Uh, uh, anyone yeah, got, I got it? it. Go on, Steve. Space. Okay. Uh, so going from biggest holding working downwards then, uh, Trimble, which you may or may not recognize, it's also features in the ARC 3D printing ETF quite heavily. Uh, following that is an ETF called the 3D printing ETF. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, third is Kratos Defense and Security. Fourth is L3 Harris. Five is JD.com. Six is Komatsu. Seven Lockheed Martin. Wait, fourth, Eight... fourth, fourth is L3 Harris. That's... yeah mental i thought i didn't realize they were that heavy into space i know these aerospace because i'm annoyed that um rtx uh raytheon technologies hasn't made in because that's got at least a little bit of um aerospace in it i know they all do i, I know they all yeah do, hold on paul you, you you haven't heard mental yet give me a second um <laughs> uh where was i eight is applications nine is thales thales ten is everyone's favorite boeing uh, 11, NVIDIA, 12, Spirit, Aero Systems. After that, we get to some highlights. 13 is Deer & Co. Um, space Tractors. Uh, <laughs> space Tractors, absolutely. <laughs> uh, 14, Amazon. 16, Google. Uh, these are some general highlights now. 19, Garmin, in case they get lost, presumably. Um, uh, 27, Netflix. 26, the US dollar. Uh <laughs> Because US dollars going to the moon. Space, <laughs> <Why>? space <laughs> Netflix. I don't understand yeah. what's going on. Why the US dollar though? Like, are they literally trying to wipe it out and send it to space? Hang on, no. no that, that, that's... So they can buy stuff on Amazon when they get up there, I think. <laughs> what, what, no, it's the toilet roll. That's the toilet roll they're going to use when they're up there. That's just, they just piled US dollars up into there and then imagine, they're going to wipe imagine. their asses with it. What's, uh, what's 30th on the list, Steve? Bitcoin. 30th is uh, not Bitcoin. It's about as useful as Bitcoin, I think. It's Workhorse. <laughs> <laughs> no way. No way yep. they put Workhorse. I, was, I yep. was surprised to see Workhorse. I think it's because of the, um, you know, the, the vans. They have the drones on the back. I think it's the drones. <laughs> the 10, <laughs> ten quid home. Yeah, the home bombing so ones. Is, is, is this specifically a space ETF or is it a space and aerospace ETF, space so. exploration and space innovation it is but the um the the, the, the other ones that were quite interesting was 36 was um Meituan, i think is the pronunciation of it that's a i think that's a chinese food delivery company yep. yes it is. um <laughs> space food um I and understand. i like the idea that there's two there was quite a lot of like the spac investors were trying to front run the etf by because there's been quite a lot of spacs that have gone into yeah. space well they've ended up with the 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 nearest position they've got is the 38th and the 39th which is 0.73 percent each so very tiny positions really so that's another loss for spac investors i'm, I'm afraid jesus because what are they going to do what's amazon are, are they trying to do they think that Blue Origin is going to be part of the Amazon thing, or what? What are they thinking there? What space delivery? Space Deliveroo? <laughs> Just loads of guys in blue suits with little like fishbowl helmets delivering your McDonald's to Mars. <laughs> so it looks it to me quite like a sort of tech and industrials ETF, basically. I mean, if you sort of take off the title, this looks like a sort of reasonable kind of ETF to me. It's got a lot of nice looking yeah. techy things. It's got a nice lot of nice looking industrials things. Sort of how you connect them all to space is, is beyond me, but I've never had much interest as a kind of investor on the space side of things. It looks sort of expensive and quite hard to really produce much on there. Obviously, there's massive upside if you can make it work, but that's how I kind of see this, I think, with quite a lot of cash available, uh, dollar at 26. What I find mm. weird is, right, because <clears throat> they've been banging on about suborbital sectors and all sorts, and then you look at this ETF holdings and you think, hang on a minute, 
where's where's Netflix come from? Like why? Yeah, I, I still I still want an explanation as to why Netflix is on there. I'm so weirded out. So it's like. <sighs> I, I feel the same. It's actually a pretty good ETF. There's a lot of value in there, and there's a lot of high growth as well. And I, I, I can't, I don't understand Netflix. I, I guess they're gonna want to watch something on the three years that it's gonna take to go over to Mars. Maybe I, I don't know. But I, you get Disney for that. <laughs> yeah, Disney will be much better. <laughs> um, but I, I suppose the the same the same argument against these crazy things that Kathy Wood says is always, well, Kathy was right before she was right. Five years ago. Uh, she'll be right again. Is that a good enough excuse to keep going and just fully believe in what Kathy Wood says, or should we really look at this and go, actually, this ain't a bad ETF for normal stuff. I like John Deere. John Deere is a great company. It's a little bit over. I think it's a bit overpriced at the moment. Last time I checked, but there's loads of good stuff. I, I'm going to guess on John Deere, there's going to be something with uh, something to do with construction there on Mars. I'm, I'm guessing that's where they're going with that one. Any others that you think you can really connect with space on there? Or um, is it just absolutely crazy? Ansys is the, I think it's the engineering company. Um, I do know they're in Fontsmith as well. Um, they've been there for a while. Uh, I think it's just predominantly engineering. I think uh, CAD. You know what? I think I've just I think I've just worked it out. They've got so much cash now because they didn't want to just release the details of it and everyone front run and make all of those spacs massively expensive. They all that cash is going to be spent on the spacs, right? And they're just going to kind of. That must be it. There can't be that much reason for the for them to miss out on so many so many actual space um, possible spacs and have that much cash lying around. There must be something to do with the timing that they're trying to get. I don't know. Do, do they still have um, the Virgin Galactic and in, in the other? Uh, yeah, the Virgin Galactic's about fifteen for sixteen from the holdings. I think it's the biggest of the sort of companies you would have naturally thought of being space companies. Yeah, but the, don't I mean, it in... could have been too specific. Yeah, they could have made it too specific if they just put space stuff in. They have to kind of. It was interesting having in Komatsu real value. so high, though. I, mm. I really don't. I mean, mm. Komatsu is a, a mining and machinery company, essentially. I thought before I reminded myself what they did, I was certain they made conveyor belts, which was was a real struggle for me to understand how they how they were going to get a conveyor belt to Mars. Um, but... there's, a, there's a lot there though if you are considering the Elon Musk vision of what Mars is going to be like in the next five years right there is, I, I get it 3D printed massive I, I totally get that I mean it's another reason for Gathy Wood to try and push 3D printing even though it failed so miserably before um, there's still going to be a world of 3D printed no doubt and I can see that I can see John Deere, like I said. I can see Komatsu. I can understand that they're going to want to have a look around for some minerals on Mars. And I don't know. <laughs> so I'm trying to justify. I'm trying to be the pro here. But it's really hard to make sense of what's gone on in this ETF right now. Why Why work us? I don't I know. Don't, I don't it understand. must be. I figure that's got something to do with the drones, drone. is it? That's what I'm it thinking. It must be something drony, right? It must be something to do with the drones. But it's it's certainly nothing else. Maybe it's just cheap at the moment. That's another mm. reason. They they got in there quite quick because it's cheap. I don't know. There's not uh, many it just um, seems like a... There's not many satellite companies, is there, in this that I can see? Anyone else? No, exactly. just like, coming back to the Carmen? Netflix thing there. I was chatting to someone on um, the Discord beforehand, and I won't say his name in case this turns out to be a bad idea. But um, does Netflix have anything to do with any satellites as a streaming outfit? So, no. yet. Um, okay. There definitely isn't any... Well, there definitely isn't any plans because they can barely afford to make TV shows at the moment. They're having to lump in $12 billion a year uh, on new content because they're so far behind on good content they need to spend that much and they still run on the Amazon i can't see them having any they're, they're they're barely free cash flow positive i think they're going to be free cash flow positive at the end of this year at the end of 2021 so there's you know they haven't they haven't got time or money to spend on 
satellites or anything. It's I suppose could that be like be space education? Could they be doing space documentaries? Does that count? Is that count as in enough to be in an ETF? <laughs> I think I think you're right. We're going to grasp at any old straws here, really, aren't we? We're going yeah. to just they did, um, uh, someone... they did commission Lost in Space, didn't they? So so maybe it's because they, <laughs> they act like that show. I actually watched the first like ten, fifteen minutes of Lost in Space and then got really bored. Hmm. And... I'm, I'm with you there. I think it's because uh, ne- I think it's because Netflix has less buffering time as well. I think, might... <laughs> I think if we're depending on Prime, I think they'll be in Mars before anything comes up. <laughs> There's a couple of industrials on there that I was wanting to see on there. Where's Otis? I mean, surely the first thing you need is a big elevator yeah. that goes up to uh, space to take you up. <laughs> you just go to just shove out any old thing these days. Like, um, uh, where's McDonald's? We're going to need to eat cheeseburgers on Mars, surely. Come um, on, if you're telling me Komatsu is a space company, then I, I want Otis. I want yeah. McDonald's. <laughs> where's, where's Kellogg's, right? <laughs> right, I'm going I'm to move this. Well, actually, Kellogg's, I can see dried food. I can definitely see that. Dry, horrible. Um... Uh, it's quality dried food. <laughs> Hang on, wasn't it, wasn't it Ricicles? They used to have a Martian on the front of the page, so they should be they the yeah, there you go. on the Winner. front of them. They did, they yes, <laughs> they did. Highest quality, reasonably priced, sprayed with vitamins. Very good for your children. Everyone buy your Kellogg's things. May or may like, not hold um, a lot of shares in that. That's how Steve um, is yeah. sprayed with vitamins. I like number five. <laughs> I like number five. What's number five? Number five is JD.com. It's a, it's a very... No, but JD is right. You know, it is um, an e-commerce um, play. But the yeah. thing is, they've got a lot of robo- robotic uh, robotics. Their entire... Um, Warehouses are literally just robots moving around and doing stuff. There's less humans. And do they make them? Do they make them themselves? Because I don't know a lot of J about JD. I believe they do. I think they do. Yeah, I think that's the uh, the unique part. I I think they do. Uh, Because last time I checked, um, because I watched a few videos and they were just saying, "Oh, we've done this. We made this robot do this," and totally automated the entire warehouse. I think more. Zach, why is why is um Pinterest not in there? Why why is Pinterest not in this? Cause, I'm sure you can justify it. Yeah, but you know, like no one's gonna bake up there, right? <laughs> going back to okay, right. Like going back airplanes to... that go 18 times the speed of sound or something, they could get there really fast, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. let's move on. Let's move on because before this gets silly and we start talking about Ariana and stuff again, right? So, so before this gets week... silly, you said. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Uh, this week has been uh, another up and down week for everybody. Uh, my portfolio, I get to sit here. I can't believe value gets to brag at the minute. 2021 is the year of value bragging. My portfolio is nice and up. I've hit way over 23,000 now, so I'm very happy. I'm just waiting for it to all turn around. I'm I'm not saying that this is the way it's going to be forever. I'm more than happy to admit that the dip might not keep dipping. Um, but how's everyone else doing and what is affecting the market in this way and why, why, why am I doing so well and uh, Zach and Steve are doing so terribly? Because you're boring, Paul. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> is that what it Definitely. is? I think Just do it. Is. Boring boomer stocks. Boring boomer stocks for the win. You're buying 200-year-old companies. Way outdated. I mean, I don't think it'll be yeah, too but... long until I see 23,000 again. I think the way it's going... <laughs> <laughs> I think tech in yeah. general is just going to get a hit for the next foreseeable weeks. But that, that's um, all right, though, because you remember ISA season's coming around and, and I have a boatload of cash to buy my favorite stocks at a discount. Yeah, yeah, Warren a little bit. <laughs> yeah I know. Sitting on the sidelines there. Um, so there could be, uh, the way I've got it, and you can add to these if you think there's any more. The way I see it is the thing that's been affecting the market probably over the last month. Uh, we've got number one. We've got... Um, Uh, Let's talk about the canal. We'll talk about the canal in a minute because this is one of Zach's favorite things. And we've all seen the memes. Uh, We've got retail investors probably getting bored coming out. There was a good article on that. I'll try and put that up in a second. And also the uh, treasury yield is rearing its head again. I will check at what the treasury treasury yield is at at the moment. God, that was hard to say, wasn't it? How how did that come out like that? 
I'll have a look in a second at what it is, but who wants to go first? What, what's what been affecting the markets this week and how much of these things have been making it worse for growth rather than value or stocks versus bonds? What's been going on? I think it's impossible to, to, to really know. I, I really dislike the fact that when something goes down, we have to have a reason for it. But I think that um, the Treasury yield is, is, is sort of important, but I think at the moment, we, I mean, we're, we're, I think we're going to talk about retail disinterest a bit, a bit later on. But they're all sort of interlinked. Is that everybody loves the stock market when you're making money? Um, everybody loves logging in and seeing two hundred pound, five hundred pound green, hundred percent, two hundred percent. But, but red is is a different thing. Logging in to see red, it just, and you're also told to turn your, you know, when you see red, just turn your account off and and, and go look another day, and that sort of leads to you doing other things um which sort of leads to disinterest but a treasury yield is 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 what it is uh, i still don't see the the marry up between earning 1.6 percent in a bond and and a, a stock that, that that was climbing 10 percent a day is now in reverse i just don't see that i think they're just convenient convenient marries together um which don't seem to make any sense I mean, yeah, further grist to your mill here, Steve. I mean, I was reading an article uh, towards the end of last week, so it's Monday now. I was reading this on Friday that was saying that, look, the yield, is, the yield on the 10-year Treasury has been moving up and down a little bit. And initially, tech was roughly moving in opposite directions to that. As you might expect for sort of fairly expensive stocks, they move inverse to the bond yield. But more recently, there was just a little bit of a slip towards the end of the week on the yield on the 10-year Treasury, and tech didn't really respond. Hmm. It didn't really surge in the way that it was kind of theoretically kind of meant to here which just suggests they might be sort of slipping out of sync a little bit and if a dropping yield doesn't uh re kind of galvanize tech stocks maybe it's something else that's really moving things around here yeah i think um for somebody who would be looking at and staring at the markets constantly and constantly worried about their money like smart money for example i can see that there is a big cocktail of things here to be worried about and i can understand that you know inflation there was the block uh selling on friday by goldman, goldman sachs, sachs yeah, yeah that's it yeah so they sold about 10 billion off of real high quality well high quality chinese stocks i believe so that i and that did a number on my emerging markets uh etf which is a bit of a shame um but so to, to the smart money, I can see it. I can see there's a lot of things to be sort of worried about. And if you're dumb money like me, I can understand that, you know, you're seeing this, these companies getting out and you're going, like you say, you see the red, the red's there. And you, at that point, when you start seeing your account in real red, and some people are, I've seen it on the Discord. I think we've all seen it on Reddit. There's people that are really like 30, 40% in the red now because they simply bought right at the big highs it's very hard to watch that and it really sorts the men from the boys really it sorts the weak hands from the diamond hands and you've really got to you've really got to have understand understood once you've got into the investment that you're in it for the long term haul not just you know writing on reddit yeah man i'm in it for the long haul this is this has now become you know this has now become a long hold i'm sure it's going to go 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 well in the future this company is going to be amazing in the future they don't they're not all going to be amazing in the future some of them will go bust and it will simply be because they've got no equity left and i'm not sure people know that and i'm not sure people realize that it took netflix 15 years to just get off the ground and in, and in that time people were really selling people were really worried there were moments in those 15 years where the stock went down 50 percent uh, I think I remember Scott Galloway saying that he sold Netflix at something like fifteen dollars mm. as a tax re uh, as a tax loss, and it's his biggest mistake ever. Yeah. And I don't know if some of the retail investors that got in last March really understand what fifteen years feels like. I think that's the same with Brian Feroldi, isn't it? He sold Dexcom at four dollars. I think he said and Dexcom's now about four hundred and forty dollars. So that he calls that his biggest loss, but he just didn't see a future for it. And I think there's times when you can see that and companies do hit. I mean, Amazon's dropped. I think Amazon's dropped 90% once and 70% as well. So you can imagine logging in one day with your 
£2,000 investment and seeing a number in the 200s and thinking, oh, no. Um, but, but it is a, it is that, a real thing. That's the thing. I mean, I'll, I'll put that in. is a bit, I think, you know, 1999, it went from, I think it, the, the number I remember is $106 it was at, and it went down to six. I don't care who you are. Okay. I don't care if you've got the most diamond hands in the world. You are not going to hold on to that stock. You've got some serious, it's going bankrupt. It was going bankrupt at that point as well. Oh, man, it'd be so hard to hold on to that stock. But then again, you've probably only got about six dollars. So are we seeing that with some of the bigger stocks right now? Is the dip going to keep dipping just because people are sort of getting worried, maybe even bored? I, I don't know. Is it conviction again? Um, they they were only in it for 2020. And come January, it's a, it's a completely new year. And people, I think, changed the momentum as well a little bit once they realised, okay, 2020, absolutely green and a little bit of red. Oh, is it going to go more down? And I think Peter Lynch <clears> comes <throat> into this, how low can it go? And I think people don't want to see how low can it go. The think, thing is, it's what, it's what we always say about knowing what, knowing the price you've paid is quite important. You've got to be able to justify the price you've paid. And if you're seeing, if you bought Teladoc at 200 like I did, and I was happy at 200 I'm really happy at 170 I, I want to buy some more. But for, for Paul, he want, he wants 40 um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, we, I'm not sure Paul will see 40 I hope not. <laughs> $40. No, I don't. No, I agree. I don't think we will see 40 Um but I do think we might see 170 for 10 years, and yeah. that gives me plenty of time to get into. Exactly. You know, it's, it, I, I mean, I know we see differently on Teladoc, and, and like, I need to point out here that as with lots of other companies that we won't mention, bullish on Teladoc. I think it's going to be an amazing company. I, I can see what it's delivering as a service and its network. You're going to mention network. I know it's brilliant. I just, it's not making money I mean, <laughs> and my, I can't my, do that yet. my point was just going to be if you're happy at 200 like i am and i'm i'm confident in my price at 200 i have no intention of selling teledoc for 10 15 20 years i don't care what the price is today i only care if i'm buying i don't care if i'm selling so i like to have a scroll down my portfolio like everybody else but i'm trying to take the, the million mile view if you know what i mean so i'm looking down at my portfolio yeah. thinking is what it is now here's what it was it's it's about 9k less than it was which is is, is quite a hit but it, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things because i ain't selling today i'm buying so that makes no difference i agree with you prices. completely on that i agree with you completely on that if if you eventually think that teledoc has a oh, i can't remember what it is is it like 40 billion in the moment or is it 18 billion there's so many market caps that have gone through it was it was 36 billion cap? at two two forty so it'll be a, a lot less yeah. than that now yeah so like you, you see it that if you think it's going to be 50 billion if you think it's going to be 70 billion it, eventually of course you've got to hold what what I'm worried about at the moment is that if people understand that, there's been a lot of people that have got into the markets recently. Do they understand what it feels like to go down to 10 billion and then eventually back up to this? I mean, even with, let's dare we say it, Tesla, like, do they really understand what that is got, well, what that feeling is going to be like? I don't think they do, but I think, I mean, one of the things that I'm looking for, and I'm not sure if it's happening now, and I'm not sure if it's going to happen exactly when in the future, and I don't have a particular plan for stuff I intend to do when this happens, but I am looking for a large class of retail investors to get the word that all three of you have said, which is bored, basically. Because think about where all the kind of retail money flooded into the markets. It flooded into the markets when there was nothing else to do. Um, there's no sports betting. There's no anything like that that's exciting to kind of keep your eye on. So even if there's not a massive drop on anything, people who have just entered markets and thinking, this is fine, I'll go along at sort of 70, 100, 300 percent a year or something, buying small caps and the like, they won't. They'll get stuck. They may or may not take massive hits. But it also feels to me like there's a certain sense of kind of anything in life that the more energy and the more attention and the more enthusiasm you plow into it at the start, the quicker your interest just falls off a cliff. And I think that's happening a little bit with things like some of the ARK ETFs. They wax and wane quite quickly. I'm not saying Kathy Wood will care about that particularly. Her time will come again, uh, probably not very far away. But with everything, if you start off too fast and you set out at an unmanageable pace 
you just burn out and you get bored and you lose interest and your portfolio will be where it is. But I am expecting a large chunk of retail money to, as things gradually reopen, as sports comes back, just to get fed up of stocks out of boredom, basically. The, the sad fact of that is that that, as investors, is exactly what we want. Because when the retail money floods out of stocks, it will flood into companies. Uh, they'll be buying products. Mm -hmm. They'll become consumers again. And that will improve earnings. And the sad fact of that is as much as we want everybody to be financially independent and, you know, and, and learn to invest because we think it's great. It's the best <clears> thing for the future is we also need you to go and buy some Coke and Apple products. That Coca great. Pops. I was going to say Coca Pops. <laughs> <laughs> Stop stabbing well, yourself. Buy some Coke Pops. Coke is in the drink, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I wanted to touch on that because that's that's a really good point to, to add here. There's Is there any guilt with you guys on something like that? Because I mentioned the, the secret savers in this uh, in the last video. I think it was released today. Um, and we're talking about, okay, so... Once everything opens, I think something opened today, didn't it? Uh, on lockdown, I don't know the difference between the garden, lockdown the and not lockdown. Yeah. The it's the garden opened, did it? It's like six people outdoors or something. Mm. I think it, uh, as I remember, um, it, it, it makes no difference all the time, and <laughs> like I've got no life anyway. Um, but <laughs> but okay, so everything's going to start opening up again. Some people have put a lot of money like secret saving into cash ices and some people have got it into investments is that money going to look pretty tasty these days once we can start flying to america and flying to europe everyone's going to go on that little bit more expensive holiday and perhaps rishi is going to bring in some incentives to make you go out um what was the last incentive called rishi's Eat dishes out to help out the last one was rishi's called dishes. Um... <laughs> rishi's dishes <laughs> Well, aren't we like still stuck on holidays though? Because I think aren't they gonna find people right now in the UK? Yeah, there's no there's no so, movement on the holiday at the moment. They still don't know what they're gonna do on that front, do they? But I still think they. I think there's just going to be a massive outpouring of spending. I think that's what we're. I think that's what we're waiting for. And I think. Yeah, and sorry. I, I, the last point of that is, are you? Do you feel an element of guilt? when it comes to this because like you so rightfully said you know we're here to invest we're we want our money in for the long term we want it to grow and eventually hopefully we might become financially independent work optional whatever you want to call it it means that other people need to not it means that a lot the majority of other people need to fail at that fact it means that some people need to work till they're 70 or God forbid, even eighty, right? Do you get, ever get guilt from that, or do you think not guilt Fuck because them. <laughs> no, not guilt because I, I don't think we're we're not responsible for other people's finances. Um, in, in much in the same vein that if they come on the Discord and they ask a question, we can answer it. We'll do that for them, but it, it's not up for us to dictate how they spend. Um, so I don't feel like you can be guilty or or even feel marginally responsible for that. It is a sad fact of the market that we need consumers to have investors. Um, but you know, I, I can't, I can't help them if that's not what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do struggle with it. Go on. Sorry. I've sir. never, I've never thought of this in, in, in the way that you kind of, um, positioned it because it's, it's the same concept where you sell high someone else buys high and then it drops. Mm -hmm. And then do you feel sorry for them? No, like you wouldn't at the well, time, but <laughs> all you'll do is, oh yeah, I sold high. And then you tell everyone in discord and. But you would never think. <laughs> you would never. <laughs> Some poor kid with his as the carrier bags absolutely full of Argo blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've. Uh, I think we've actually spoken about this quite a few times of the greater fool theory. I do not like it. I don't like buying companies with the idea that someone just has to buy it for more expensive than me. So I, I'm I'm big advocate of yield, and I, to a point, I do kind of feel a little bit guilty about i mean i don't i'm not in mcdonald's anymore but in order for mcdonald's to succeed and continue paying out dividends and well it doesn't grow very well anymore but um if for that to happen a lot of poor families do need to get obese and things so i, I you know i i do think about that sort of thing sometimes so i, I mean 
like you say, it's personal choices, isn't it? And we shouldn't really be, we shouldn't really be responsible choices. But on the other hand, I do think a lot of it is about poor education and poor, <sighs> poor advertising standards and things like that. Maybe that, if, you know, if they didn't consume so much, maybe they would uh, become well, more financially independent. The, the thing about that is like if that, that does bother you and it does make you feel guilty, then, you know, look into ESG investing. ESG investing, economic social yeah. good investing is, you know, using the power of the investor to make businesses make changes for the better. So if you worry about McDonald's serving crap food to poor people and, and making them obese, which, you know, is a genuine concern, um, you know, get on the board, get get your vote on uh, McDonald's, force them to, you know, group together, force them to make better quality food, force them to make better nutritional food uh, and you know if that's that's the way you want to you want to invest i mean that i found that because i've been investing the longest here and i found that the general gist of investing is you've got to throw all of your morals out of the out of the window like uh, you can't say like if tobacco is the, the hot thing and you don't invest in it you miss out on a huge return if alcohol gin is selling like crazy you want to be in a gin company the, the the sad fact of investing is that like you you really have just got to completely forget about. I mean, I vote Green Party for God's sake, <laughs> but it, you know, I've got to like completely throw my morals out the window, and I've got to back pharma companies in America. I've got to back, and and it really is about the company. It's got nothing to do with the the morals, as far as I'm concerned. You've got to just completely keep it blinkered on the company, the story. Forget about the rest. You can back the cow. Yeah, I'm saying this company. as an. Im- I'm saying this as an investor in companies like BAE and Boeing. Raytheon Technologies. <laughs> yeah, anything like that. I, I understand. Yeah, I understand. I'm not a full ESG. Well, I'm not even close to an ESG investor. Um, oil as well. I I had. I'm coming out of those and I'm moving into more sectors that I that I think. But those sectors are eventually going to trample people as well. You know, Tesla hasn't got what got to where it was without crushing a few cars. And I'm sure that FSD is going to hurt a lot more people as it comes to fruition. It won't be their fault. I'm sure it won't. But, um, uh, yeah, I like you've got to blinky yourself and um, not really think about things. Like, uh, Zach, what you got on the Suez Canal? Because this has been a big story for you. You're an insider on this one, haven't you? So Suez Canal, a lot of people don't understand the stocks that they're in, a lot of these companies ex- export and import, and a lot of it is added costs. The more problems we have with the shipping lines, etc., the more uh, expensive it becomes for companies to buy containers. And yeah, I jumped on that a little bit too quick. We're talking right now about the Ever Green or the Ever Given. I don't actually know Ever, what the real name is. It's- Ever Given is the ship's name. And Evergreen is the right. infamous company. Okay, I'm... right. That makes sense. Because it's confused me because I've been looking at the news and they keep saying Evergiven. I'm, I'm like, Definitely yeah, it says Evergreen, Evergreen on the, on the side. Yeah. <laughs> Does it... I'll, I'll book names work. Evergreen was new to me. I think I, I confused a lot of people because obviously, like you said, that on the side of the ship in massive, it just says Evergiven. And you're thinking, is there some sort of <laughs> silent letters here going on? <laughs> no. yeah. But, um, but okay. This... This has been a meme, like a meme generation system. That picture of the the uh, the boat and the tractor on the side. Drawing a, pe- oh. drawing a penis before he actually went into the canal as well. Did you see that? You know. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. I saw the ship. The ship had to draw a penis and then went yeah. on its uh, GPS signal. That was absolutely. Do uh, you know the digger? The digger's got on a Twitter account, a bit like Parik, and it's actually hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's just it's bio just says I'm trying my best. <laughs> yeah, I, I think today I think I got some news. That this affected any stocks in particular? The fact that it might have oil. I think Steve W was going to get into oil there because I think there was some um, changes in the price. I think I've got some numbers here. Uh, we have. I think it dropped down to sixty dollars uh, for Brent crude, uh, and then it. it it kind of picked up again, back to sixty-five. But I mean, when it when it initially happened in last last Tuesday, um, it did shoot oil price up only because of the kind of the backlogs of energy shipments built up, um, because there was a lot of vessels behind the Ever Given, 
um, that were just full of barrels, I guess. Um, but right. I mean, ultimately, other than oil, I guess the kind of the generalized um, viewpoint is that it was generally bad for most businesses, especially smaller companies who were doing um, sharing containers. So it wasn't a case of uh, it being affected for, say, for example, B&Q or King, Kingfisher, um, only because they they kind of pre-plan well well before three months, uh, usually. Um, so it wouldn't have really affected them, but it would have affected, say, for example. So they've got. Are you saying they've got an inventory of? Yes. Yeah. Stock so they, that, they, they, okay. Yeah. So last than three months. So most okay. big big companies, um, say for example, home bargains or BM B and M, they'll have up to about three months worth of stock. Uh, in the in the warehouses, so it won't really affect them. It'll affect, say, for example, um, Dave's apparel company, who who brings in a certain number of shipments um, every week. Made to order stuff. Yeah, I get you. I get you. Uh, what what's actually on the boat? Does anybody know what's what's on I, the boat itself? Because it's was, a big old boat, isn't it? We the company that I work for, it's a freight company, and um, we have tents on there. So we have tents. Yeah mountain boots and all sorts and i think uh, a lot of companies in the uk i read today as well they had um there were forklift um trucks on there as well on that heavy it's there a about... big boat i imagine it's got some homeless people on it some asylum seekers <laughs> uh, it's got i mean I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing though here's the thing <laughs> steve w is just appalled at that joke <laughs> completely appalled <laughs> we had the thing was we had live animals on there i don't understand oh. why where they're going but they had to oh, be geez. on there for a week and um, i'm hoping they got fed um so the, the thing is you know the the reason why it was such a big issue to be fair it wasn't a, that big of an issue because it was only it lasted for a week um, but it could have been because we've already had kind of a shortage of uh, containers so during the first lockdown when china uh, initially kind of kicked it off. Um, lockdown measures quickly spread to other continents and majority of well, like Euro, Euro, Europe and North America. And it was North America that kind of screwed everything up because Trump at the time was saying they were okay. And, you know, coronavirus is never going to reach them because they, they, there's a massive ocean in between. And containers on the water were still heading in. I mean... There were companies still open in America and they were still uh, accepting these uh, containers. So as the factories closed temporarily, these had to be stopped at the port. So you've now got this massive pileup of containers um, at the port. And and they're all empty. They're all completely empty. No, they were full. These were full. Oh, right. So, oh, so right. these were wow. full. And you see, now, these, now the fact that these are piling up, shipping lines were like, hang on a minute. Why are we sending more vessels because it's not they, they're not going to give the containers back and the shipping lines are not going to just wait at their port uh, waiting for you know the companies to come you know uh, or open again so all the offices so they kind of uh, restricted the number of vessels going in and some of these were even the infamous evergreen that now that become for, famous for the over the last week um so this completely halted imports and exports i mean Who's picking these piled containers up? No one. When China, so mm. so so the, the unique situation um, that that kind of occurred after this was that China recovered and resumed its exports. I believe it was the first to open back up again. Whether we believe them, um, whether they had no coronavirus, no, we no one knows. And now they're asking for these containers back because their their companies have opened up now. And since no one's on the other end to receive, you know them and. It basically broke the chain because the US weren't even giving these containers back. So going back to the Evergreen, what are the implications? I mean, oil shop, as we know. Um, another case was there was a massive kind of imbalance with North America and China. So there was a 40% imbalance, meaning for every 100 containers um, that are ex exported to North America, only 40 were coming back. So you've got 60 out of every 100 containers accumulating at the port, which is mm. staggering. I mean, I've got the numbers here, and there's roughly about 900,000 containers um, sustained on that trade route alone. 
and what happens is once there's very little supply of containers the pricing of the containers goes up so it went up from fifteen hundred dollars per container to forty five hundred so three x and for small companies that's staggering because they, they're basically just going to have to absorb all the costs so for anyone listening it's another case of um it's another case of the big companies are just going to swallow the little companies again small businesses are going to be affected by large corporations yeah, I, mean, I mean amazon ain't no. amazon ain't going to be affected by this is it you know uh it's a shame it is a shame so yes yeah, so, so it's another case of inflation then right basically i mean it's costs are getting driven up and the companies that do well are the ones that can push those costs through consumers okay on this kind so in this case it's kind of supply side inflation basically a lack of kind of materials yeah. and products yeah, and yeah. that kind of thing um whereas we've been previously thinking about quite recently sort of uh dollar printing uh demand side inflation increased demand that kind of thing now we're thinking about supply getting cut down a little bit which is creating more of that sort of thing yeah yeah I think... and to put that in uh put, in, put that in perspective for the idiot here just to confirm it because uh i have to get my head around it this way that is simply products are going to go up because there's less of them coming into the uk and uh, or America, or whatever you want to say. You would say US because that's an easy one to do. So, products are going to get uh, product prices are going to go up because there's less, which you know, more demand, less supply, and of course we've got more supply of money. So that's making money cheaper, hmm. and that means everything is just going to get more expensive. If you want it proper idiot proof, mm -hmm. just think like the PlayStation Five. You know, the PlayStation Five came in. There wasn't an awful lot of supply in it. So if you went on eBay, you had to pay two grand for one. That's generally supply side inflation. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good that's a very good satirical example of that. That's very nice. Okay, I want to want to move on to one last little thing uh, because I think Steve D is itching about this. I don't know a lot about the CrowdCube and Cedars. Um, is it a merger that's been blocked? Yeah. Go on, yeah. explain it all. Yeah, so um, CrowdCube and Cedars are, are crowdfunding um, investment. Um, platforms they, they both run very similar operations but they often attract decent companies to each platform so you really need a, a platform on both uh, Cedars and Crowdcube if you really want to see the best companies and I mean companies like Revolut have raised on there, uh, Chip, um, Monzo is another really famous one so there's been some real quality come through these platforms and, and there's been some questionable quality as well that i think steve and i are invested in so just to explain crowdcube and cedars are company uh places you can go like trading two and two for example where you can invest in companies before public right yeah so essentially a, a company will put up a pitch and they'll say that they want to raise i don't know five million um and then you can all, the, we would all work together, all the people on Cedars and Crowdco would put in like five pound, 10 pound, 20 pound, five grand, whatever you can spare. And if they get to the five million target, they then get the release of funds and they get to spend that on the things that they've told you they're gonna spend it on. Um, and the idea is, is that when you read a lot of Cedars and, and Crowdcube's material that they basically say the same thing is that these businesses need to operate at scale. They just cannot make enough money um, without, charging ridiculous fees to the companies that are trying to raise on there to to be a functional business so they propose to merge together to make one i say big but i use it in the the loosest term possible these, these were going to be a, probably a 250 300 million pound company not not much more than that um but they were going to join together to be you know this 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 combined force for crowdfunding which would given them the scale to uh to raise uh, money for companies and the scale to actually make a profit um you know and and be sustainable and unfortunately very short-sighted cma have blocked the merger and they've had to they've now officially fully called it off they called it off yesterday afternoon uh, just because they said that it would make one it would make a conglomerate essentially um you know no competition and and that was unfair but it's my I'm I'm pissed off about it really because I think it's it's just short sighted. Like the UK is desperate for a tech sector, and you're about to create something there that was arguably some of our best and brightest fintechs coming together to make a really interesting company that that might be another avenue for investors to you know be able to place some money and actually get some decent deals out of the market. 
And it's been blocked for the reason which just seems like, I mean, we're not talking about Amazon merging with Shopify here, do you know what I mean? Or Amazon and Google merging. We're talking about two smallish companies merging together for, for, for the, uh, go on, go on, Steve, I can see you itching. Yeah, in, in the, two things there, I guess. One is this is in the same week that uh, Canadian Pacific Railroad, so basically a monopoly is acquiring Kansas City Southern. So another basic monopoly here. That's fine. Uh, two small fintechs merging together is apparently not. That strikes me as, yeah, quite short-sighted. I mean, this is also another thing that kind of bears out your point here is that delivery IPO, um, UK financial regulations, which in fairness, I think Rishi Sunak is attempting to do something about, partly because he thinks he has to, um, partly because it's generally a good idea. I think delivery when it IPOs is foot in eligible two separate classes of shares it has owner shares which basically have significantly more voting rights which means that their ceo can not get overrun by a hostile takeover here but that makes them FTSE ineligible so think google different classes of shares uh, and that kind of thing um these kind of things are these are the kind of things that get the uk a bad name uh with these kind of things it's very textbook yeah because it just goes and says okay over 25 percent of market share okay you're not gonna you're not gonna kind of combine together. I don't. I don't think they put much effort into this. If you think about it, <laughs> all they said was, "Okay, it's gonna cause um, a havoc with the the market kind of um, forces." I think they said it's gonna be obviously too um, monopolistic. But are there any? And this is based on just like. And this is based on. So this is based on just sort of. Uh, arbitrary numbers that they've put in, like they're going to cross twenty five percent. The twenty five percent. I think it was too easy of... for them because there was. Is there any competitors to these guys? I think... Not when they merge. There's, there's, there is. I think there's one. There's an angel investing site, but you need a lot of money to invest. And in. I think it's twenty five thousand yeah. in investment. So I think the fact that there's hardly any competition as well, I think it just makes them so much easier for them to kind of just say, okay, no. But this is it. Though. Is this is anything... why Kazoo Kazoo has announced today that it's merging with AJAX. It's going straight to the Nasdaq. This is why you know Arrival went straight to the Nasdaq. I mean, what what do you, what does what does what do we want? Do we want to have Shell, Legal and General, more banks, fucking Aviva, or do we want to have all these fintechs? I mean, what Monza? I mean, are you saying if Monza, somebody offered Monza a, a SPAC to go and list on the Nasdaq, they, they would go and do it? And they we would, need yeah. companies like this to refresh the FTSE. The FTSE is a boring they, ass crap. <laughs> do you think they haven't been? Do you think they haven't been pr- approached by a SPAC? They must have been approached. Well, by I a think SPAC, right? I think so. But I, I think the money that. Monzo only seems to raise like 20 or 30 million at a time. The money in these SPACs at the mm. moment is like three, four, five hundred million. So that would, I think that would easily get Monzo through to profitability. So I'd be amazed if they haven't been approached. But yeah, because these guys yeah. raise what money in a day and everything. It, it money in up, an hour, don't they? Oh, yeah. Some, yes, hour. Sorry, not a day. Because uh, I remember the first, there was quite a few rounds as well. I think I was on the second round. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, no chance. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. So, has is, is Crowdcube got much um, uh, competition abroad? Has it got much over I think there? Cedars like... is seen as more of like the EU equivalent. So, Cedars does okay. a, a lot more sort of EU companies, where Crowdcube seems to be a lot more UK focused. Um, that's not strict rules, but that that's how I would visualize them. But for instance, like Cedars got Sono Motors on the EV company from Germany. I think it is with the solar panels on the car and the broccoli in the dash. Um, and Crowdcube can, tends to get your Monzas and Chip. I think is another. I think Pluto was on there as well, which is a, a, one of our insurance. That that's that's the UK's lemonade is Pluto. Um, mm. But yeah, it's just it's, just, it's just such a strange decision. I just cannot get my head around it. It's very it's very much a shame that the UK has no out and out tech stocks. The best it's got, as far as I can see, is like hydrogen at the moment. Like. I think even that's yeah. pretty pretty lame to be honest with you. And then on the other hand, and... when you go in fintech, you've got you've got JP Morgan coming over this year and it's gonna it's gonna drop Chase onto us. It's gonna that's gonna be a massive thing for and I would probably even go and get a Chase account if it comes over because I, there's gonna be a lot of maneuverability to that one. They're gonna, um, they're gonna bring Chase Bank over to the UK. Yeah, yeah. Um, JP Morgan's bringing over Chase to the UK oh. as an online-only bank. Ah, okay. In the yeah. same that... way that Goldman Sachs brought Marcus over, I think, yeah. is, is the sort of idea they're going for. But will it be a savings account yeah. on stuff? Or... 
there's a they're saying a fully, they're I saying mean, fully fledged I, bank, aren't they? Oh, wow. fully fledged yeah, bank. I think I think they're going for more Monzo Oof. than Lloyd. Let's put it that way. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be quite a big thing, I think, over Monzo. here. And even I'd go for it, maybe. Monzo better spark yeah. in time then. <laughs> right. Um, we've got ten minutes left. We're on fifty minutes. So, anyone got a stock of the week that they've got on the top of their head? Should we do transmedics? We were going to do it a couple. Of, yeah, a couple exactly of what ago. I was thinking. I'm glad. I'm glad you said transmedics because the only one I could think of. Right. What is transmedics? Um, you are the best. You are the best one for transmedics. Um, we, I think we're mostly all of a fan. Are we invested in it? Just for full disclosure. Yeah, I've got, I'm I've invested got in it. Yep. Steve W is the only one that's that's not invested in it, so he can tell me. He can he can fight. He can fight the bear case on it, even though you probably haven't got a lot on Transmedics. Have you? <laughs> so uh, Transmedics is a really, really interesting company. So I, when I was looking at the the data on the company, well, essentially they 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 for they they have developed a machine that can help um, transfer donor organs to the recipients and can keep the organ alive longer. At the moment, we effectively use like a cooler and some ice, and we pump it full of chemicals. And if we don't get there within two hours. The, the organ um, just dies. And they were saying that only 20% of donated organs actually make it to the hospital. Um, and then there is a further reduction in, in those that are actually um, accepted by the, the, the receiver. Um, so, oh, this is horrible. The way, just for the purpose of people on the podcast, Paul has loaded up the uh, Transmedics um, website. And it's probably the goriest website you'll ever see. And if you want to see a heart beating outside of a body, be my guest. It's awful. Um, <laughs> Let's try and get it loaded. But yeah, so they have. Um, they already have FDA approval for the. Is it the? It's the heart. Is it the lung system? They have FDA approval for. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So and they've um, they've got the lung system and the liver system um, due to be um, due to be a, well hopefully approved soon. But essentially, the system um, can keep the organ alive for ten hours, which which greatly increases the radius in which that. Um, the uh, that they can travel in order to get to a receiver and obviously keep the uh, keep the um, organ alive. They can monitor the organ. They can check its vital signs. They can they effectively keep it working like an organ outside of the body. It really is a fantastic system to look at. Um, it's actually got a, a low. I think it's under a billion market cap still as well at the moment. It's also it is a we are talking about a small company here, risky small company. You know, risk of execution. Um, but yeah, yeah, and anecdotally, because um, I can provide a lot on this, uh, you'd be surprised. Oh, I don't, I shouldn't go into too much detail here, and I definitely don't want to. <laughs> I don't want any dark humor out of this one. So uh, the filter is coming up. I'm trying to trying to say the right thing here, but we, as paramedic, we do get a lot of people to hospital whose heart is beating, but we know they're not going to survive and they're going to get called. So, and I've seen them, I've, I've seen them immediately try and get these organs out and they know they've only got a four to five hour window to get them to the patient and things. So this is a massive, massive company that if you're thinking ESG and one thing I do here on all the YouTube channels, uh, you know, when you see, oh my God, 10X stock, this is going to be amazing. Whenever you see any of those, they always follow it up with what what sort of stock is going to like invest in stocks that are going to really change the world and really do good and better things. And so far, and I have gone as deep as I could into this stock um, within reason. And I can't find anything other than a dialysis machine that does this better. Essentially, like you said, where the next best thing is some ice and a cooler ice, ice and a lot a lot of diesel so when you're investing in these companies if you're going for really speculative stocks which transmedics is like you say it's only a billion market cap and it's definitely not profitable yet well i'm sure you'll get to the profitability profitability of that in a minute um but this is a company that could really change a lot of lives i think and that's why i'm in it um this is very speculative for me, but I think it's a company that I, I, I can see the benefit of as pe as someone with lots of transplant patients in, in the family as well. So, yeah, uh, 
like you said, the business wise, you've got to cut yourself off. We've got to blinker ourselves and say, okay, it's a great company, but it's got to, it's got to earn some money. It's got to earn me some money. I've got to find a greater fool maybe, or eventually it's got to pay a yield. We've had arguments about that in the past, but um, how's this company going to make money? How does Transmedics it, bring it to the... It makes money in two ways. It's really interesting. So it, it sells the machine itself. Um, although it looks like the margin on the uh, machine itself is quite low. It's It only seems to be about 10 or 15%. But where they actually make their, their major margin is on the sort of all Gillette um, blade and, and, and model sort of ratio. So they will sell you the machine at pretty cheap prices. But every time you transport an organ you will have to replace the chemicals that are used in the um, machine and you also have to replace the filters. Um, so yeah, that's really the model they're using. Um, it's sort of a, a recurring revenue machine transplant as a service kind of thing. Yeah, and we've got this here that um, it's the details that it, it changes because I haven't got the what it changes it to, but... In, in reality these days, only two out of 10 lungs are ever used, only three out of 10 hearts are ever used. And this is in the cooler system, but they've made it to like a 90% ratio here where, where only one in 10 are not being used, which is quite a big thing. And it shows you, shows you your picnic cooler box. Remember when you were a kid <laughs> and your mom used to drag that out when you, when you went to the beach or something uh, with your sandwiches in? That is basically how we carry hearts these days um, around to get them into people. And naturally, only 30% of them actually make it there. So I, I think this is a, I, I think I, I don't do speculative very often. And I think this one has got more emotion in it for me than than proper value investing ideas but i can't say any more than that i i really like it zach are you in it i'm in it for the similar reasons because it's almost a feel good stock it i know we once joked about okay it doesn't matter how much we put in at least we're doing humanity service <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i mean yeah. it is maybe Sorry, and I was going to say it is, it no, is, it is um, no, we, Steve can get on to it in a second because I'm curious as to what he's thinking. <laughs> um, it is um, a one billion, sub one billion um, dollar. And I think they have got kind of a pathway to, to profitability as well. And they've got a strong team behind them. We'll know what they do. And I think they're only prioritizing the, um, the organs that have low kind of shelf life outside of the body. So they are, they understand what they're doing and where the market is. And I think the segment that they're trying to kind of um, disrupt, in a sense, um, is is something that is favourable because there's a strong strong team behind. I think uh, I think there was a surgeon as well in the company. I, I don't know if it's the CEO, and he said uh, when he saw that organs were coming in in kind of these cooler boxes, these ice full of ice and basically ice pop. Imagine I, loads of ice pops and you got an organ in there. He was disgusted and he said, you know, I'm going to change this. I think that's how he founded the company. But it's just like, the, it's just sort of common sense, isn't it? You think to yourself, like, if you was transporting a heart, would you sooner have it beating and functioning in a machine? Or would you sooner have it on near zero degrees and pump full of chemicals? I think one is the more natural way of transport. And it seems like, almost like common sense, but I, I always sort of fear common sense in the, in the same way. Um, there's obviously a reason we put it in a cooler box and uh, and take it away, but it's uh, yeah, I just think it's almost if it, if it does what it says it does, uh, and they can get the 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 liver version and the uh, the heart and lung versions all all FDA approved, then I, I can't see how this won't be required in nearly every hospital in the world. But hey, and it's just Not worth annoyed, saying. But you just before uh, you sorry, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump in there, uh, Steve W, because uh, just before you piss all over our chips, um, <laughs> because I just want to make one big point here and just say that this company is already out there. If you go to their website, you can see exactly where they are in locations all around the world. And they've got a significant amount in uh, Europe, uh, particularly I would totally expect it in uh, Germany and Italy because those those sort of places. One in Kazakhstan. That that just I, I have no idea why that's there. 
Uh, well, of course, I know why it's there. I just don't know why it's so isolated oh, it's, uh, there. But um, is there is there one stuck in the middle of the Suez Canal somewhere? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, we're we're sort of close in Saudi Arabia, but maybe they've nicked I, it. I, I don't think, know. I think it's anywhere where there's a kind of a radius of twelve hours or so, isn't it? Yeah, uh, but just um, just to point out that this, like, they've got them all over the world, and in the UK, in, uh, in specific, uh, in the UK specifically, we've got four. We've got one in London, one in Cambridge. Oh, so you're pr um, one of you guys is going to be pretty lucky there. Uh, one in uh, the QE, which I am silently trying to get a look at, and um, one in Manchester as well. Uh, so, so uh, this. You know, we've got a lot, a lot of locations. This, this, this thing is already out there. It's a real product, which is, which is a lot to say for a lot of uh, new startup companies they, they, these days. It has a real product that is being used already, uh, and I'm hoping. And it's a real product that I think is going to change the world. Go for it, Steve. W. You've got the last word, I think. So I quite like a lot of these kind of healthcare companies when I look at sort of them and I look at there's loads of good ones around. There's kind of nano X look quite good. There's one that I quite like called Eradimed, who basically make medical devices, but they make ones that are non-magnetic. So you can put them in MRI machines, basically. And I think they have a kind of patent on that. The reason I don't kind of jump into these a bit more enthusiastically is because I feel wildly out of my depth making judgments about what might happen there. And Steve D ended his last thing with if. And there was quite a big bit of ifing in there. I mean, what kind of goes off in my head when I think about these sorts of companies is they are, to me, indistinguishable from Theranos, basically, um, mm -hmm. which was a blood testing company that was eventually. Because they had a really good product, but not loads of really good products. And they kind of got started, but then they kind of wound themselves down. And that, to me, looks like a risk that I'm not in a position to judge, which is what puts me out of these kind of things so that's the reason you three are in and i'm not and it's just that i don't feel qualified to evaluate this kind of thing totally and I agree suspect that it looks like there's loads of these really good things but something's going to go wrong somewhere and i don't know whether it's this one and knowing my luck it will be the damn one that i pick <laughs> totally agree um this uh, will highlight that this is a totally speculative yeah it's a um, moonshot play uh yeah, it definitely is, um, and you need to be aware of that. And we have all determined our own risk as part of our portfolio. To I mean, I haven't got a million in it. Well, I haven't got a million anyway, but I've you know I've got a couple of hundred quid in it just to you know get us over the line. Uh, just uh, a touch on Theranos there. Uh, latest news on Theranos: uh, Elizabeth Holmes. Someone nod and tell me that was her name, Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, um, she it still hasn't been trialed for that. She's on trial for that. And she's had it delayed now because she got pregnant, conveniently got pregnant. And uh, that, that means her trial has been can't denied be in jail uh, if you're delayed two years now. Yeah, but you can't be put on trial if you're in pregnant, uh, if you're in pregnant. Yeah, you can't be put on trial if you're pregnant. So that trial is now going to be delayed for two years, I believe. So we'll end it there on that lovely highlight of a note of... Uh, uh, a small bit of the US law system there. Um, thank you very much for watching, guys. Uh, this has been another hour, and hopefully we've had some real positive comments recently, and thank you so much to everybody who's listening and watching. I think a lot more people are listening now, which is what we really wanted. Uh, we want to see... I haven't looked at the stats myself, but that sounds really good. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please leave a five-star review on the whatever podcast system you're listening to. This will be on Apple Podcasts, Audible, Chromecast, and... Uh, Chromecast? Uh, Google Podcasts is what the official thing is called, not Chromecast. And uh, the other one, Spotify. That's it. Spotify. Yeah, and also thank you so much for uh, leave a like, subscribe, and uh, a comment or a question or anything you want to talk about uh, on the YouTube version of the podcast. And once again, thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next week. Thank you all.